Hello, my name is Jenna Nichols, and today we're going to talk about uh, structure 2.4.1 and 2.4.2. They both have to do with the bonding triangle. So bonding is described best as a continuum between ionic covalent and metallic models represented by the bonding triangle. And the position of a compound in that triangle is determined by the contributions of all three bonding types. So let's review some of the properties um, of compounds that are affected by their bonding type. Um, so those ones that I want to talk about today are solubility, volatility, um, conductivity, brittleness, um, elasticity, Uh, or plasticity, and then uh, corrosion. So solubility um, refers to whether it's going to be soluble or insoluble in water or other solvents. Um, ionic compounds and polar covalent compounds tend to be soluble in water, uh, not 100%, but tend to be, whereas um, nonpolar covalent tend to be soluble in nonpolar solvents, but not in water. Um, volatility has to do with um, how well it evaporates or how much it evaporates at a given point. So evaporation, the more volatile a compound is, the more it evaporates. Um, so with increasing volatility, you're also you're going to have weaker um, intermolecular forces because it's easier for it to break apart and evaporate. Conductivity, we're typically looking at um, conductivity as a solid, molten, or dissolved in water. Um, metals tend to be condu conductive as solids, um, whereas ionic compounds are going to be um, conductive when they're molten or dissolved in water. And covalent compounds are typically not going to conduct electricity. Um, brittleness is like how much it breaks apart. Um, ionic compounds tend to be more brittle. Um, glass tends to be more brittle. But like metals are not very brittle. They're more malleable. They're able to be bent and shaped without breaking. Um, elasticity and plasticity. So elastic things are things that when you when you like pull or stretch them, put them under force, they will um, like snap back into their original shape when you release that force. Uh, whereas plasticity, when you mold and shape, it's going to retain that new form. Um, so, like metals, some metals tend to be more, um, have more plasticity, where you, you, know, you can bend them into different shapes and they will keep that bent shape. And then, of course, corrosion, which has to do with um, how much they're going to oxidize at any given point. So all of these things are affected by their uh, the amount of substances, ionic bonding versus metallic bonding versus covalent bonding, and we're going to look at that more specifically in the next few slides. Okay, so here's a picture of the uh, bonding triangle from the IB data booklet. It's also called the uh, Van Arkle Ketelar diagram. Um, and it essentially shows the types of bondings present um, at different uh, electronegativity points for two elements. Um, so we're only going to do this for binary compounds, two elements. And um, on the y-axis, you'll see the difference in electronegativity between the two. And on the y-axis, I'm sorry, the x-axis, you'll see the average electronegativity of the two. And you can find the electronegativities in the data booklet as well. Um, and you'll be able to use those values to figure out which category it fits best into. From there, you can also determine um, what kind of where it falls, the percentage covalent character and the percentage ionic character. So like if it's kind of halfway in between, 50-50, it's probably going to be in this somewhere in this polar covalent ionic range. Um, whereas if it's you know, closer to the x-axis, it's more likely to be covalent. Uh, unless you have only metals present. Uh, and then the reverse is also true. The higher you, you know, the greater the difference between the two elements, the more ionic it is. Um, the more we'd say there's a transfer of electrons between the two elements versus sharing. Um, so it really is more of a continuum between the three types of bonding instead of, you know, just a very clear cut 
it's not 100% one way or the other. Um, and you don't have to be able to calculate these percentages, but if they um, give you two elements, you will have to use their electronegativities to figure out where it falls in the triangle. And then from there, you can kind of estimate where it falls in the percentages. Um, but just an estimate, you don't have to calculate exact percents. So this bonding triangle uses cesium and fluorine kind of as a, a baseline. Does that make sense? So effectively, you can imagine at this corner, I've got two cesium atoms. And then in this bottom corner, I've got two fluorine atoms. And then at the top here, I have a cesium fluoride. And so if we use our electronegativity data from the periodic table, um, cesium has an electronegativity of 0.8. Fluorine has an electronegativity of 4. So 0.8 and 4. So the way that you would calculate it average, right, is the average between the two. So 0.8 and 0.8 divided by 2 is 0.8. And the difference between the two is 0. So that's where you get on the um, x-axis here. Same thing with fluorine, because it's the same, the average is four, and the, um, the difference between the two is zero. So that's why we're right here at the bottom. Now, if we were to calculate for a cesium fluoride um, compound, the um, difference between the two is 3.2, and the average is 2.4. So that's where you get, uh, you know, it's like here-ish. Um, that's where you get the top of this bond here, 3.2, 2.4. Um, and so that's where you get the peaks of your triangle or the points of your triangle. Um, so this cesium fluoride is essentially completely ionic in character. When you just have cesium, it's just the metal. It's only metallic in character. And when you just have fluorine, um, it's very nonpolar, uh, covalent, only covalent in character. Um, and so you can kind of use that as a reference point and other things will fall kind of in between those three. Don't forget to relate this to um, what we already know about these, these types of bonds. So metallic bonds have that sea of um, delocalized electrons. So the, the free flowing valence electrons that gives it conductivity and malleability. Um, so the more it's in this station, the more delocalized those electrons are in the bonding. Um, ionic, it's definitely going to be a lot more localized where um, the more electronegative atom is pulling more on the electrons. So the uh, electrons that are forming the bond are going to spend a lot more time next to the fluorine because of its uh, high electronegativity. And then um, the more nonpolar covalent that it is, um, the more the electrons are evenly spaced around um, the uh, two atoms but not truly delocalized. They're, they're um, in that shared overlapping high, uh, orbitals between the two. So let's relate this to the um, period three oxides. Um, so I'm going to go with sodium, right, or alkali metal, Na2O, and then moving our way over magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide, um, silicon dioxide, tetraphosphorus, deca oxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, and um, dichlorine monoxide, dichlorine monoxide. Anyway, um, so as you go across that third period, right, effectively, you're going to wind up, um, if you were to put all of these on the bonding triangle, you're going to wind up with three categories, basically. Whereas these three are probably going to have mostly ionic character, right? Um, the metal and the non-metal very much follows the um, ionic properties, you know, conductive as a, as a when they're melted or when dissolved in water. Um, silicon dioxide is the next one over, and silicon dioxide is what we call a giant covalent or a network covalent. Um, it's going to have some of the properties um, of ionic, like um, the, it is conducting electricity, conductive electricity, um, but it's not going to be super soluble in water. So it's kind of in between the two. 
Um, it also has to do with you know, why we call silicon a metalloid. And then as we continue to go across, um, now we're getting into just the covalent. And you'll see that you'll have like a polar covalent versus nonpolar covalent. Um, but there is kind of like a, a pattern here, ionic to giant covalent to covalent as you're going across that third period. Okay, so what, uh, let's look at an example for this type of problem um, and what type of bonding is predominant for the compound PCL5. We need the electronegativities for them. Phosphorus is 2.2, chlorine is 3.2. Use your data booklet for that. Uh, and then to find the difference, uh, you just subtract difference is 1. And then we'd find the average between the two. We get 2.7 as the average. So it's like here-ish. So that means we're right about there, which gives us that PCL5 is predominantly polar covalent um, in bonding. And so it says now describe the physical properties based on that bonding type. Well, polar covalent is probably going to be soluble in water, um, less soluble in nonpolar uh, solvents. Uh, it's not going to be very conductive of electricity. Um, you can also predict things like intermolecular forces based off of this, like um, it's more likely to have dipole-dipole uh, interactions and London dispersion forces uh, based on that polar covalent bonding between them. More likely, and it's not a perfect um, prediction, but it, it certainly helps. Um, so more soluble in water, but not conductive based on that polar covalent type. Okay, so the linking questions for this um, topic, uh, it links to structure 3.1, um, where, where the properties of those period three oxides. Uh, 3.1 is all about periodicity. And so that's when we were talking about like the sodium oxide all the way down to like Cl2O, um, where it's more likely to be ionic in character of the oxides um, to the left of the periodic table. Uh, and as you go across, they're more likely to be non-metal oxides. And non-metal oxides tend to be more acidic and uh, metal oxides tend to be more basic. So following that pattern, that periodic um, trend across is going to also relate to the difference in the ionic versus covalent uh, versus giant covalent in the middle um, for that. This topic also connects with like just nature of science, um, structure 2.1, structure 2.2, which is you know, different types of bond. And so like, what are those limitations of discrete bonding categories? Um, why is it not always work saying something is definitely ionic or definitely covalent? Um, and I always like to bring up things like um, uh, we talked about the metalloids and like silicon dioxide glass. Um, you can also think about like graphite um, where they're going to, you know, maybe sharing electrons between them. Um, you'll see those covalent bonds, but then they're still able to conduct electricity where typically you would not see um, conductivity happening. Uh, in covalent compounds. So yeah, just putting them in these uh, individual buckets doesn't always work because sometimes, depending on the individual elements, you're going to see differences in properties uh, that maybe make it don't fit, make, makes that compound not fit perfectly within the category. And so this also connects with um, the rest of our um, bonding unit structure 2.1, 2, and 3. Um, so why do composites like reinforced concretes, which are made from ionic and covalently bound components and steel bars, why do they have unique properties? You really want to just think about how it's using the best of all of the compounds. Um, you know, different things that make it structurally sound. Uh, the steel bars add the rigidity and um, things that are ionic or covalent are going to be less resistant or um, less uh, prone to oxidation like steel would be. Um, they're going to have, you know, differences in solubility. So some things are going to dissolve really well in water. Well, if we're making a bridge, we don't want it to dissolve when it rains. So by, you know, fi forming these composites um, with multiple types of bonding present, you're going to be able to make stronger, um, tougher materials that are more resistant to damage uh, than an individual type of compound on its own.